We've seen uh, things uh, ratchet up again in terms of pressure. Uh, we've already seen Huawei targeted, obviously. Now the US uh, threatening to ban five uh, Chinese surveillance firms, which really does introduce a human rights dimension to all of this. So is this really only all about trade, or is there something bigger going on here? Well, with Huawei, there's no question there's a legitimate U.S. Um, criminal law enforcement with respect to our, our criminal laws that are important to our national security. Um, so, I mean, I, there's little question that um, President Trump has made statements that um, have suggested that he wants to use that kind of enforcement to create leverage in his trade negotiations with China. But we have, the United States has, a legitimate reason to be um, engaged in the investigation of Huawei and, and the imposition of the ban uh, that we recently imposed. Now, in the heat of the 2016 election campaign, pretty much every candidate wanted out of the TPP. But uh, in retrospect, uh, would the U.S. perhaps have been in a stronger negotiating position through all of this had it uh, remained or joined the TPP? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, served many important purposes for the United States. But one of the biggest uh, is that it really put China in a corner, and it gave the United States great leverage uh, for future trade negotiations with China. Uh, it was made up of 12 countries, all of which touched the Pacific, but it was also designed for more countries who touched the Pacific to join the agreement. It had a whole accession process by which new countries could join. And every country that touched the Pacific Ocean was lining up to join it, uh, except Russia, China, and North Korea. Uh, even India and Pakistan were sending signals they wanted to join it. They don't touch the Pacific. And what would have happened is, within a relatively short period of time, every country uh, touching the Pacific, besides those three, India, uh, sorry, uh, China, Russia, and North Korea, would have been in the agreement or in the process of joining the agreement, and the Chinese would have had absolutely no choice but to join it themselves. Uh, that would have put the United States in a position where the U.S. holding the key to China's entry, China cannot enter the TPP without U.S. approval, could have sat down and could have um, had tremendous leverage in insisting that China bring itself into compliance with all of its World Trade Organization agreement <laughs> obligations to the United States before even talking about entering into an additional uh, TPP trade agreement with the United States. So th that leverage was leverage that the Obama administration spent eight years of painstaking negotiations for the TPP to create and to have over China, uh, or at least for the next president to have over, uh, over China. And then President Trump withdrew the United States from the TPP on his first full business day in office, not even beginning to comprehend the implications of what he was doing. And that was only one negative implication of us pulling out of the TPP. And yet the Trump administration is still pursuing those one-on-one -on -one negotiations with different countries, bilateral negotiations, whether it's with Japan or the European Union. Will these help in offsetting some of the issues that have come out from withdrawing from the TPP prematurely? Some, not others. Um, certainly, if the United States can enter into a bilateral free trade agreement with, with Japan, that will solve some of the problems of U.S. beef producers and other U.S. producers being locked out of the Japanese market, uh, or at least not being able to compete in the Japanese market uh, with uh, producers like uh, beef producers in Australia who are in the TPP and have much better terms for their beef to enter, enter Japan than, than U.S. producers do. Um, but there, you know, the strategic element of the TPP will not be replaced by a bilateral agreement uh, with Japan alone. Uh, and of course, the, the U.S.-European talks, um, that's a different story. For one thing, that doesn't affect the strategic dynamic in, in the Far East. But also, um, we're still stuck with the, t with the Europeans in the sense that Europeans won't talk about agriculture. Uh, and to be fair, the Obama administration, which was negotiating with the European Union, ran into that problem of the Europeans not wanting to talk agriculture, and the Trump administration is running into the same problem. Matt, is it a strategic goal of the U.S. administration to contain the rise of China as a Chinese fear? I mean, we have heard directly from President Trump saying that under his watch, China would not become a top superpower. That's a great question. Um, first of all, contrary to the world in which President Trump lives, on this planet, China already is a superpower. Uh, second of all, um, I think it's the official policy of the United States, and I think there is a tremendous consensus um, on both sides of the aisle here in the United States, both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, political appointees, career people. I think there's a consensus that 
Um, the main objective here is to bring China into compliance with its World Trade Organization Agreement obligations to the United States. Uh, many, many things China is doing in its current economic expansion and its economic plans violate basic trade obligations that, that China has with not just the U.S., the EU, and other countries, and China's violating those. Uh, that's just not acceptable because the United States, the EU, et cetera, we, we respect those obligations with respect to China, um, and we, we expect China to do the same with respect to us. Now, in a world where China is following its World Trade Organization obligations and it's still expanding tremendously um, as an economic power, then you have a lot of division of opinion here in America. You might have President Trump saying he still wants to shut down China, uh, whereas others of us are a little bit less afraid of China. If China plays by the rules, then we feel confident that the American economy, the American worker, the American farmer can win on a level playing field. Uh, Matt, just quickly, what does President Trump need to be able to stick a pole in the ground and say it was all the, all the success, all worthwhile? <laughs> Well, President Trump is a master of what I call theater of success. Uh, he completely failed in his trade negotiations with uh, South Korea, and he had tremendous theater of success. And he failed w with respect to all the important things uh, in the North America free trade agreement renegotiation. Uh, and he also had, again, um, not quite as good, but fairly good theater of success. So it doesn't take a lot for him to stick a pole in the ground and say he succeeded, but it would take a heck of a lot for Trump, President Trump to convince anyone he succeeded. Uh, the reality is he just doesn't have the leverage um, that he would need to succeed uh, um, in a way that most experts here in the United States would consider this a success. He threw away the TPP leverage. Mm -hmm. Um, his bluster and baloney doesn't create leverage, contrary to popular belief. Uh, the leverage of the retaliatory tariffs were undermined when China retaliated to our t retaliation, um, something to which Trump opened the door uh, by retaliating against China outside of the World Trade Organization's process for retaliation. So he doesn't have the leverage he really needs to get um, what people here in the United States would consider a successful result, and so he's stuck. Um, either just escalating and escalating um, or trying to fail and then to try to declare victory, um, which would be a lot tougher with China yeah. than it was with, the North, with South Korea or the North American countries.